We got swim bait nuggets here. And before these things can actually be assembled and readied for fishing, I've got to get a paint job on these things. My plan is to chrome plate all these pieces separately and then put them together and paint them with my favorite paint scheme. The color scheme that I've had the most luck with both in freshwater and saltwater. We'll paint all of them the same and we'll take them fishing and see which one gets bit first. And if this is your first time to the channel, my name is Franco. I'm a professional engineer, a lure designer and lure maker. And I make these videos to share some of the tricks and techniques I've come up with and learned and to add a little bit of physics and engineering to the art of lure making. All right, I've got the booth set up for this stuff. And for those who've never seen this before, it's kind of a really interesting process. You're actually plating with silver. It is a metal. What you're actually doing is spraying a solution of silver and the chemical that causes that solution to drop the silver out. And you spray those at the exact same time and have them mix on the surface of the lure. And for that, you need a duplex gun. This is something I made myself. The chemicals go into these two canisters and as you spray it, they come out of this tiny nozzle. And right now I just have water in here just to make sure that the gun's working right. But you can see it's drawing from both of those tubes. And so all I got to do now is just rinse these guys out and put the appropriate chemicals in there. And we'll take these swim bait nuggets and we'll give them a mirror finish. Now the process is with a spray gun. So you really want to have a respirator on and I'm going to have the extractor in this booth going. So it's going to be noisy and I won't be able to talk anyway. So as I'm doing it, I'll explain the process with a little bit of voiceover. First, you flame the surface of the lure with a blowtorch. You don't want to get it hot. This process just creates a charge on the surface to help with the next step. Dipping it in a sensitizing chemical. This prepares it for the silver. Then we rinse it off really well Give it another dip and make sure we get all that sensitizer off with distilled water and then it's time to spray the silver. And it starts off looking pretty muddled and pretty ugly but it slowly spreads and lays the silver down nice and even. This never gets old to me. It always looks like a magic trick. Once I'm sure it's well coated I have to get all that chemical off so I have to rinse it really thoroughly. At this point the process is done. There's no curing time or drying time. Now I just blow the water droplets off with some compressed air just to be sure it doesn't get any stains on it. And you end up with something that looks like it should be in a jewelry store. And we just repeat the process for the rest of them. That's the last one. Now all I need to do is get these things semi sort of temporarily assembled so that we can come back to the paint booth and paint these things. All right, First, it's time to assemble these guys. And I made a small mistake. I didn't make enough of the middle pieces. I've got one short. So I'm gonna be able to make a couple of these two pieces 
a three piece and then a five piece instead of a six piece. But we'll live with that. Assembly is pretty simple, especially for these two pieces. All I gotta do is stick this twist eye in here and I'll glue it in really carefully with some two part epoxy. I like using the Gorilla Glue. And to be sure the glue doesn't get up into the hinge, I just put a little on the very end, wedge it in there and then fill the cavity in the top with some UV resin. And then the parts that are more than two, I have to put the back end together with a pin and that pin just slides in there. And then I put a drop of UV resin on either end just to keep it in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the short ones, the two piece ones. And just so you know, I protected the surface of the uh, silver plating by dipping it in some clear floor wax. What that does is it protects it from my hands and it protects it from anything that might tarnish the uh, the silver because it's silver It will tarnish but once it's painted and clear coated. It's protected forever that finish lasts a long time This is a, a lure I made. Uh, I don't know maybe three years ago But it's still in really nice shape and it still has a nice reflection on it My plan is to paint them all exactly the same because I want to test them to see if one size gets more attention from the fish than the others and the paint job that I find that has been the most productive paint job that I've ever had is this. And I call it gold chrome green top. It has obviously the silver underneath. There's a, a little bit of gold running right in the middle of the, of the lure and then green on top. And then of course the black top and a little strike eye. This thing catches everything. I've caught eight pound bass with this little guy and I've caught huge redfish with the same lure. So it should be a pretty interesting experiment to see if this carries over to bigger lures. All right, as usual, we're gonna have a batch of noise in the background. I'm gonna start off with a ghost tint golden yellow. These, all these colors are all gonna be transparent. And that's really the important part is using transparent paints so that the, really the chrome will really pop out. The lures at this point aren't assembled permanently. They haven't been glued. I have them temporarily dry fit together so I can paint them, but they'll have to come apart for the clear coat.
I'm done with the paint. I'm gonna clean my airbrush. This airbrush was giving me a lot of trouble. It was spattering and not really flowing very well. So I think it needs a little bit of a bath in the ultrasonic cleaner. And I burnt the heck out of my finger. To light the shop, I have LED bulbs all over the place, except for one incandescent spotlight that I forgot. That guy. Enough whining. After I get this thing good and clean, I'm gonna go ahead and separate all the pieces out on their separate holders, and then I'm gonna spray it with some polyacrylic as a mid coat to basically seal everything that I've got on there. And then it'll be time to clear coat all the pieces separately. And how many is that? Two, four, six, 12 pieces. So I can only put 10 items in that turner at a time. So it's gonna be a two batch deal. So I'll get back to you when I start clear coating. All right, time to clear coat. I'm doing this one first because I dropped it. I'm hoping that uh, it won't look too bad. So what's nice about using that mid coat is that it immediately levels and just goes on perfect. All right, that's the last one. All right, this is a great time for the question of the week. This is where I answer questions directly from the comments from subscribers. And this week was kind of a really interesting question. It's a little more of material engineering than lure design. The question was, is if you have a screw in or twisted wire hook eye, is it better to cast the lure around that twisted wire or screw in eye, or is it better to glue it in? Which one is stronger? You have to know what the failure mode is. How is it gonna fail? What is it that's gonna break? And on an arrangement like this, where you have a load pulling in that direction, more or less, the way this fails is through shear. And if I draw a blow up of it, let's imagine that this is just a big cross section of a screw and eye. And we're looking at a, just a small section of the threads on a screw and eye like this one. But if it were a twisted wire, the failure mode wouldn't be much different. It just might be a little less or more strong. And if this area of brown cross hatching is the material the lure is made out of, then what you're gonna see as this gets pulled in that direction is that the material the lure is made out of is gonna fail in shear. And it's gonna shear along a line right at the top of those threads, right at the peak. So those areas highlighted in red will shear out along with this screw. So the strength really lies along this line. And if we're casting the lure out of epoxy resin, or we're gluing this in with epoxy resin, there's gonna be some differences because you may have some micro balloons in your casting resin just to lighten it up. And that might change the strength a little bit. So if you cast the lure around your screw and eye, this is what it's gonna look like when it fails. If you wanna glue it in, you can make it a little stronger because you can drill an oversized hole. And I'm exaggerating a little bit here. And by using two part epoxy glue, you end up with a larger cylinder of glue and a much bigger contact area. Because if this is the tail, and let's say you drill a hole just big enough for the screw to fit in and then glue it in, that is the surface area you have for the adhesion and the strength and shear. But if you make that hole slightly larger, that surface area increases quickly with the change in radius. And assuming that the glue is gonna be slightly stronger than the casting epoxy, the shear failure is gonna be along the outside of this hole you drill, and it's gonna be between the glue and the casting resin. And by making it larger, you have much larger area and you can increase that strength. Now this is assuming that you mix your two-part epoxy just right and that you fill this cavity in completely so it doesn't have any void. So gluing it in is potentially stronger, but in practice, I would prefer to cast it in because I'm more likely to get a better bond and have that screw eye fully surrounded with the casting resin. But really the takeaway is that you can do it either way. And if you're gonna glue it in, drill your hole a little oversized and make sure it's all filled in. All right, let me show you my process for assembling this thing. First, let's do one with a screw eye for a hinge pin. And I'm not sure you're gonna be able to see, but there we have the little hinge pin hole 
at the top of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill this up about halfway with uh, UV resin. I don't want too much in there because I don't want it to ooze out into the hinge pin. The good thing about this stuff is it doesn't really run. It tends to stay put and it won't set up until I hit it with the light. So I've got a bunch in there now. So that should do it. Now I'll mix up some two-part epoxy and I'm mixing up very little. The two-part epoxy will only be used on the pins that are also hook eyes. The regular straight pins will just be glued in with the UV resin. Now I'll partially assemble this by sticking the pin through, making sure it captures the eye to make sure the two halves are held together. And then I've got about as much wire sticking out as the thickness of that bottom section below the slot. And I'll just smear the wire with this stuff. And this kind of glue in works really well with offset eyes. In other words, eyes that are like a really big angle off of the toe eye because when they get pulled on there's a lot of friction already so now i let it drip down a little bit and then you turn it clockwise to help pump it in and i'll take a little bit of denatured alcohol and clean off any excess and i like to take a good close look in that slot and make sure i didn't get any on the hinge pin now I'll, I'll kind of pressure fill the rest of this hole the very top and hit that with the uv light for a good two minutes so it gets down in there and then i'll just leave this sitting up like that so that i'm sure that the two-part epoxy won't ooze up into the uh, hinge slot. All right, so this one is gonna be a third hook on that five-piece one, because that's such a long lure, I wanted to have a third hook somewhere in the middle of the lure. All right, and for the section set, all they do is take a pin for the hinge, and this is just a piece of two millimeter stainless steel pin. All I do is slide the pin in there to capture the loop. I'll push it in until it's buried below the surface. Make sure it doesn't come out on either end. Make sure it has nice movement. And then all I do is put a little plug of UV resin on top and I'll just harden that. Do the same for the other end. And within probably 10 seconds, that'll be set. And we have our pin set and it can't come out. Now I just need to put the tail on this and put the other ones together the same way. All right guys, we're at the water. I couldn't make a trip to the to the uh, golf, so no saltwater fishing today, but we're out here in a good spot. I've always gotten pretty lucky here and caught bass, so we're gonna give this thing a, a shot for bass but first let's take a look and see what they look like just reeling them in the water looks clear enough so let's take a look all right we'll start off with the smallest one two part all right that looks pretty good there's a little baby bass i just spooked off <laughs> Ooh, that little baby bass is interested. Oh, there's a big bass following it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Let's get into a little deeper water with it. So what I'm doing is I'm letting it drop and then I'm giving a little bit of a crank just so it swims a little bit and I'll twitch it to make it look like it's not in good health. The twitching puts out a lot of flash with that silver plating. All right, that looks good. Let's try the three part, see what that looks like. Oh, look at that. That looks amazing. <laughs> that is just beautiful. Perfect. Well, we may not learn anything about what the fish like. <laughs> but we're certainly seeing how it behaves in the water. Ooh, that's the, the mullet. There's like a big school of like mullet that are like 18 to 20 inches long. I wonder if that spooks the bass. You can see even the birds are attracted to the, uh, to the mullet. Let's pitch this out there. Look at that, that looks like a real fish. Just that, the motion looks perfect. It really does look like a real fish, like you're looking down at a fish swimming along the bottom. Look at that. Slowly, I can just... Oop, it caught the bottom. Caught a freshwater clam. This guy bit down on the hook. <laughs> Let go, dude. Uh. Ha 
I wonder if bass will eat like a small mullet. I would imagine they would. This isn't really the spot I want to fish. It's just a good place with a sand bottom so I can show you the swimming action. Let's see what it looks like if I really rip it in. Absolutely stable, rock solid. And that movement goes all the way up the body. That is really nice. All right, let's go fishing. So I've gone ahead and put one on each rod and I'll be casting each one of them in areas that I think are, uh, are good areas. Let's see if we can't catch something. Of course, this is not scientific and it won't prove anything, but at least we'll have the fun of making some sort of assumption. So this is Rodman Reservoir, and there's a dam way over there that was uh, put in place, I think back in the early 70s. And there's been a, a big controversy of whether to sort of undo that dam and free up this river or just leave it in place. A lot of environmentalists want it to be freed up, and I'm all about the environment, but it just seems to me that this is a really unique environment now. I mean, we've got just hundreds of acres of stump fields and it creates a lot of habitat for a lot of different species. I mean, I've seen everything from manatee to otter, you name it. Curious, if you're from Florida, what's your opinion? Take that dam down and let this river flow free? Or should we keep the, the, uh, the dam up and have a nice broad expanse of water out here? All right, this is a, usually a pretty productive spot right here. There's a, a bunch of logs running out. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw this one one more time and then I'm gonna switch to medium. I guess we'll upsize to medium. I'm a little afraid to throw the big one in here because it sinks a little faster and I'm afraid it'll hang up on one of these logs. There's some nervous water right here, right in front of me. That's definitely bait fish. Let's cast past it and see if, uh, if there's something underneath. Yeah, they got, they went down deep now. They saw me, but they didn't look too disturbed. So I'm not sure anything was after them. Ooh, scared something. Man, it is still and hot. I don't think I've ever been here where it wasn't blowing pretty stiff wind and I've had to fight the wind to stay off the beach. Today is completely still. All right, it's so hot that the GoPro keeps overheating when it's on my chest mount. I'm just, dripping sweat. Let's switch to the uh, five piece. Slowly roll it through all these logs and stumps. Well, I fished with this for a little while, but it's getting a little too late in the day. I've gotta say, I've never been skunked. Well, I rarely get skunked out here on the, uh, on the reservoir. What I'll do is I'll leave you guys with some underwater footage. I'll go ahead and get underwater footage right now of all three of these lures so you can see how they swim and what they look like painted up and swimming. All right, thank you for watching. Give me a thumbs up if you're enjoying this stuff. Let me know what else you'd like to see on the channel. And if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. It's free. I'll see you on the next one. Stick around for the underwater shots though.